my first year in yeshiva was in london england and uh, there was a guy who lived in the community and he was a what do they call it graphologist when they can read your handwriting yeah and he used to come once a week for a year with somebody. And then uh, we found out during the year he's a graphologist. So we used to take him out handwritings and he wanted, he wanted to tell me all about myself. He didn't want to do it. He was very sensitive. He didn't want to tell us too much. But I once gave him my handwriting and he told me a couple of things. And one of the things he told me was, you need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> you guys said that? And it, yeah. And I actually made an appointment with an eye doctor not long after that. And I got glasses. That's the first time I got glasses. And I once asked him, how did he know? And he said, because I was starting my lines at a different point, like more indented, less indented. It wasn't starting in, I wasn't starting my lines in a straight line. I think that's what he told me. <coughs> For him, that was a sign. That's a good observation. Yeah, once you read up on these things, I've read a couple, I used to read a couple of books on that. I mean, there's so much to look at. So it's amazing. Yeah, let's see. Kind of like this? Oh, I can see a whole world in that one. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we are back and we're studying Talmud Megillah, page 6a. And my goal is to get up to the next Mishnah today on 6b. You think that's possible? Maybe if we go quickly. But there's some really interesting stuff. We are in the discussion about identifying different cities, ancient cities of Israel, trying to figure out where they are, what they are. This was all sparked by the conversation about what is an ancient walled city and what's not, okay? So we are on page 222, actually 223, in the Steinsalz current edition. And we're on the second paragraph. But before, just the, to the, this is in the middle of a piece. What was the piece? So the Gemara said, the Gemara said that Zeira said that the city, ancient city of Kitron is the city of Tzipori. Tzipori is a village, northern Israel. Uh, why is it called Tzipori? Because like a bird sits on top of a tree, so this city sits on top of a mountain. It's a very majestic city, you know, perched on top of the mountain, and that's Kitron. Which meaning, it's very far north in Israel. So the Gemara challenged that, is Kitron, could Kitron be Tzipori? I have an indication that it's not Sipir. How so? So we went on a lengthy diatribe that Kitron is in the inheritance in the area, territory of Zvulun. Okay? Now, Zvulun complained to God. God, why have you given all of my brethren, all the other tribes, much better quality land? And I get... I don't have nice uh, lush fields and pasture. I have like very rocky cliffs and mountains. So God said, you have some of the best commodities in the country. Okay, you're by the seaside. What were the three things that he had? He had the chilazon. He had that squid fish that you can get lots of money for the chilazon dye. You have tuna. And you have special white sand that you could produce high quality glass. You have the best commodities. So... Um, all right, so then he thanked Hashem, but he told Hashem, I don't know if we actually did this last part. Let's go to uh, the top of uh, 223, right? Tani told us that Sfune is a chilozen, Sfune refers to the chilozen dye, Tumun is a tardis, Tumun is the, is the tuna fish, or some kind of fish, and Choyel is the schuchis, Lavana is the white sand, that can make very quality glass. So Amal Lafana says, Vulun turns to Hashem and says, thank you for notifying me about the amazing commodities that I sit on. However, Ribbon Allah, Master of the Universe, me, my Diyani, how am I going to be able to control who gets permission? Meaning, I, you know, someone can take a boat out to sea and start to mine and, and, and retrieve all of my chilozain and all of my tuna, and how would I be able to, like, it's a very hard asset to control. You can't make borders in the sea. And in those days, they didn't have a, uh, what do we have in the sea nowadays? There's huge warships, right, to control borders. Well, they have the coastal guard. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if it's in like like it compares to Naftali had very nice land. Okay, land you can put sentries, you can put fences, you can really protect. How am I going to protect these these assets? So you know what Hashem answers him. Amalei God answers. Sham Yizbuchu Zivchet Sedek. He quotes a verse that says, "There they shall offer." They shall uh, sacrifice offerings of righteousness. 
What does that mean? Simon Here is the following sign you should know. Anybody who takes one of your items without paying for it, meaning they steal from you, he will not prosper at all in his business. Says God, if you hand if somebody handles their business unlawfully, you should know that they will not reap blessings from that business. Okay, and this is an idea that we have in many instances where in terms of uh, profiting in illegal ways, whether it's being dishonest and cheating, stealing, whether it's um, working on Shabbat or on festivals, all times that God says now is not the appropriate time to be earning money. And if you still do that nonetheless, because you're thinking the more I work, the more I'll make, says God, Parnas is in God's hands. Either you won't make as much as you think you will, or even if you do make it more, but who controls your expenditures, right? God will send your way all kinds of um, expenses you were not relying on, not expecting. And so the money can never be a source of blessing. We look at making Parnassah from Hashem. We are the creating vessels. Right? Hashem is the source of Parnassah. Hashem decides on Rosh Hashanah, in fact. Right? How much are you going to make? Okay, if Hashem decides how much I'm going to make, so why do I have to work during the year? So I think a, a, good, a good analogy is that on Rosh Hashanah, God decides your budget, your income budget. Your X amount is allotted to you. But just because the money is there in the budget doesn't mean you actually have it in your account. You need to be depositing checks to actually have it in your account. Uh, the, the checks that you're depositing, that's the effort that you put in to creating the vessel to receive these funds from Hashem. So yes, there may be this allotment for you, but you're not going to be receiving it until you're actually going to be partnering with Hashem and working, and that's going to be the deposits you make into your account. And if you don't do that, you won't be getting it. At the same time, you can't work more or work in illegal ways to be earning more than was allotted for you. So this that was allotted for you it says, God, just you work in the ways that I prescribe six days a week and the right balance of work. Don't sacrifice family. Don't sacrifice your obligations, your duties, communal, religious, etc. davening times. All these things that we think if I skimp on them, I'll be able to work more and earn more. No, no, no. Whatever you're allotted, you will earn if you just work the responsible, the balance, the amount that God has, shamed, God, God has said you should work. And more than that won't get you anymore. It's a very important principle. You can't beat the system. What's the famous story? That Moshe Yes has a very has a song. You know Moshe Yes? If you don't know Moshe Yes, um, I think it's Moshe Yes's song. Maybe it's A.B. Rodenberg's song. Ah, two unbelievable composers. So Moshe Yes is in the world of truth right now. We can't bring him here, but it's my dream one day to bring bring A.B. Rodenberg here to do a concert. Ah, he's the best. He just A.B. Roddenberg, who just came out with Journeys number five. He put out Journeys number four journeys many years ago, 20 years ago, and just came out number five. Ah, you gotta listen to it. My kids, I play to my kids, we love it. Okay, so there's a famous is song. Like, is that like Uncle Moishi? Nah, 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 nah. This is stuff you, you would appreciate. Great composer. So there's the song about. He's in Spotify? Yeah. There's the song about the. Was it the Chais of Lublin? Or. I'm gonna send it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah this is this is life changing stuff. To work tomorrow. Yeah, I'm giving him online a lot of. Oh, but we can't listen to music these days. Are we allowed to listen to his music? Who said you can't listen to music these days? We can't. I'm asking you where, where, where does it say I that you can't? That you don't shave and you don't listen to music. The two are not on the same level, but I'm not gonna go online about on record about this. But <laughs> after we'll go off record and we'll talk about it. Okay, so. One of the tzaddikim, maybe the, the seer of Lublin, and maybe it was Rabbi Tzaddik, one of the tzaddikim. So every day he would have a, a, a maid or a servant in his house who prepare food for him. Every day after um, learning, after the base managers, after work, he would come home, and there would be a dish, waiting, huff, delicious meal waiting for him at his table. And before he would start to eat, he would turn to Hashem and say, thank you, Hashem, for providing everything I need, and then he would start to eat. And at some point, the cook, the chef, the maid got really upset by this, and like, He's turning to Hashem, but like God didn't provide the meal. I provided the meal. Okay, what about a thanks to me? So I have a plan. Tomorrow, I'm not going to make a meal for him. Let's test the God 
<laughs> he thinks, right? Tomorrow I'm not going to prepare a meal. He's going to come home. He's going to think Hashem, but it's going to be nothing in front of him. And he's going to realize who he really needs to think. And that's his plan. In the meantime, in the morning, when this Rebbe, this tzaddik, was on the way to work, somebody stopped him in the street and he said, Rebbe, it was two parents, mother and father, Rebbe, you have to help us. There's a serious crisis with our child who's in the hospital, very ill. The doctor is saying that there's no chance in the world. What can we do? And the uh, tzaddik stopped and gave them blessings and gave them some advice or something, and it's going to be okay. Okay. That evening, like every single day, the tzaddik comes home from his work, and he comes to the table, and the maid is standing behind the door, all excited for his or her plan. There's nothing there. He's going to think Hashem. So he sits by the table, as he does every day, and he turns to Hashem, and he says, thank you, Hashem, for providing everything that I need. In the meantime, the, the table is empty, and the moment that he finishes his prayers, and the, who's going to have the last laugh over here? The doorbell rings. So the maid goes, the servant goes to answer the door, and there you have these two parents. We need to talk to the tzaddik. He's busy right now. What about? We brought him a special gift, a delicious meal, and we prayed for him because he gave his blessings this morning, and it worked, and the child is better, Baruch Hashem. And here is a delicious meal for him. Understand? Great story. We need to have that kind of anymore. Listen to the song. It'll help you. Okay, so now getting back to the main point that we went off, off point with, with the whole Zvulun. Huh? Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> this is getting back to our original point. What is Kitrin? You want to tell me Kitrin is the beautiful city of Tsipuri? Am I misreading my mother? Why was uh, Zavulun so um, resentful of his portion of land? is a is a glorious, majestic village sitting on top of a mountain. I mean, everybody would love to have Tsipuri part of their part of their um, estate, part of their portion. Right? That's the question. In other words, Kitrin is not Tsipuri because Kitrin is in Zavulun's portion, but Tsipuri is a beautiful land. So why is Zavulun complaining? Maybe you'll say that even though Tsipuri is a glorious, majestic city, however, it's missing something. It's missing a big blessing. Because the blessing of the Jews going into Israel is that Israel is a land of flowing milk and honey. And maybe one thing that Tsipuri does not have is flowing milk and honey. What is the blessing of flowing milk and honey? The Torah mentions it many times. What does it mean? You've been to Israel, I've been to Israel. You ever see the streets flowing with milk and honey? What does it mean? That there's a that is in that like a metaphor for abundance of okay. food. Okay, so it could be yeah, that could be. There's a lot of commentary about this. In general, the honey. One of the main commentaries is the honey we're talking about over here is not bee honey, but date, honey. date or nectar, like fruit honey. So talking about vegetables and fruits. And, 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 and well, the honey is the oozing out, and when a fruit is oozing, it's a symbol of how ripe and lush the fruit is. It can't even contain its own. Right on the trees, it's already oozing out. That's how uh, lush and how plentiful there is of the fruit. So this flowing honey is the symbol of um, very uh, fertile lands growing high quality sweet fruits, and the flowing of the milk is you know you can milk a cow or a goat but how often does a cow or a goat actually drip milk it will drip milk if its udders are so full and how is its udders getting so full because the cow is living on this very plentiful land eating high quality free range organic uh what are the other words sustainable um, sustainable green grass and therefore it's actually oozing that the milk is dripping out so, so that's a lot of Israel has that apparently. But in Zvulun's land, a lot of it was very mountainous, as we said. He didn't have lush pastures. So that's what he felt he was missing. He was missing on the flowing milk and honey. And that's what he's complaining about. So the Gemara suggests maybe that's what he's complaining about. No, it can't be. How come? Because Lakish said, I have seen the areas in the city of Tipuri that are flowing with milk and honey. But have a shisha asa mil, a shisha asa mil, it is four mil by four mil, 16, sorry, 16 mil by 16 mil. That's how many square mil? 16 by 16, that's a lot. I've seen Tipuri has vast amounts of land that are flowing with milk and honey. It's not lacking in anything. 
Maybe you'll say the lawn of fish did they get Maybe it has a lot of land flowing milk and honey, but not as much as it's as the portions of other tribes. Maybe they have much more, and that's why his volume was complaining. No, also not the case. I have measured the areas in the Thai land of Israel that are flung with milk and honey. And to describe the amount of land in Israel that's flung with milk and honey is like the measurement of from Bay Koivi to the fortress of Tulbakni, which I have no idea where these two places are. But the Gemara says it's Esrin Vitartin Parsi Urcha. It's like 22 parsings in length, or Pusya Shita Parse, and six parsings wide. Now, a parsing is four mil. What's a mil? A mil is not a mile. A mil is a thousand amos, sorry, two thousand amos, which is close to a kilometer. A mil is about a kilometer. A parsing is four mil. The whole of Israel, all of the fertile lands, flung milk and honey, is how much? Is 22 parsings by six parsings, which would be times four, would be 88 mil by 24 mil. That, that's the whole land. Of that's, no. that's the amount of land in Israel that's flown with milk and honey. Oh. Now, how much was in Tiberi, we said? Six by six. So, what's the ratio of proportion of six by six out of? Uh, 88 by sorry, 16 by 16. What's the ratio of 16 by 16 out of 88 by 24? It's a very large portion, it's much more than a 12th. Well, it'd be a 10th, more. No, what I'm saying, but it's divided. It's what I'm saying is we have 12 portions in the land of Israel. You had two and a half on the other side, we're including their portions also. Okay. Okay. It's part of Israel, right? You want to do the math for us? Whatever, it's a very large amount. So Zvulun has had more than their fair share. Okay? Much more than many other tribes. It was 16 and 16, right? Do, well, do, first do um, 88 by 24. Is what? 21, 12. 2, 1, 1, 2. Okay, you remember that. Now we want to do 16 by 16. 56. 56. So, 10%. Uh, okay. a little more than 10%. A little more than 10%. 9%. 14%. Sorry. 12%. 12%. Um, 12 okay. That's pretty good. He, 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 what's he complaining about? That's 12 tribes. It's more than your share. So, what's he complaining about? So, the Gemara says, I feel little hockey, sodless, uchrami, madifale. It's true he had plentiful of flowing milk and honey. It's true he had a scenic land. It's true he had lots of commodities of the chilazon and the tuna fish and the white sand. It's true he had everything going. But he was Jewish. They were Jewish. That's a kvetch, of course. <laughs> and he want, he says, but I don't want that. I want more fertile pastures, flatlands to, to raise my animals. Maybe that's where he came from. I want what I, I want what I don't have. The grass is greener on the other side. Here he's saying that literally. Yeah, this is where it came from. This is where it came from. Yeah. Daikanami, we can also actually um, infer from the verse that that was his complaint because the chsiv, because he compared himself to Naftali, the Naftali Amareme Sode. Naftali has on its heights lots of sode, lots of great fields, pasturing lands. And I don't have that, and that was Zvogun's complaint. So now we've concluded, yes, Kitran can build can be Tsipari, and yes, it was beautiful lands and flowing with milk and honey and full of assets and commodities, but it just did not have the large pasturing areas which he wanted. And therefore he complained to Hashem. Good lesson from there, right? Let's continue. I'm going to try to go a little quick, at least for the next page, because it's a lot of just analyzing of verses, but then we're going to get... Okay. Rabbi Abahut said, so the Pasuk says in Sfania, the, we? with the top of 224. In Sfania it says, Ekroin shall be uprooted. So some, what's so bad about Ekroin that it should be uprooted? So the Gemara says, Zu Kesari Bas Edoim, this is Kesaria, Caesarea. 
the daughter of Edom. She was Sheva's ben Achoilis, that it's situated among the sands. Yeah, you know about the city of Caesarea, Caesarea right? You've been there? I was there in the last trip. Oh, you were just there. What did you see there? Remember. We saw exactly this. There you go. Yeah, what, the uh, Where did the you see theater. The theater, the, the stadium. Yeah. The theater. Is that a theater? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. okay, so a bit of history about Caesarea. Um, during Jewish times, like for sure during First Temple times, it wasn't a major city. Jerusalem was the major city that was very much built up, and it was more like a, a fisherman's city, right, right by the right by the mm -hmm. sea, mm -hmm. and it was a bit of a port, and there was a lot of fish industry there. But during uh, Second Temple times and during the times of Herod, so Herod was a we spoke about him recently, I think. Yeah, yeah. The big builder, right? So in Jerusalem, he had to respect the Jews. And therefore, he actually helped the Jews. He built, he, he refurbished the whole second temple into this magnificent place. But elsewhere, he did his own building. And one of the cities, a place that he really built up, and that was his prized jewel, was Caesarea. And there he built a magnificent empire of a city um, with the stadium he built there. And it's that place where the horses. Uh, and out. Yeah, so that's not the stadium, but separate there they have the horse racing place. And then he went and built into the ocean. And then he built the pier and yeah. into the ocean. Yeah. And um, later on, it becomes like a capital of the Romans. Where once the Romans already come into control Israel and destroy the Jews, they create their set up their capital over there. Their government was there. They were functioning there. Um, That's where the governors were. There's a story. I mean, today, Kesari is known as a beautiful city, really, really high end city. I think the only full it's size. A it's a tourist city. And, and a yappy city. Is that the right word? A yappy city? Yeah. Yeah. The best of the mansion live there. You know? <laughs> there is uh, all the big houses there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And. The famous uh, artists and stuff. Like that. And I think it has the only full size golf course in the whole Israel. Huh. Yeah, very yucky. Yeah. <laughs> it's near the breakers where you're going to be hanging out with this. <laughs> That's right. People like you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Yucky. <laughs> okay, but so there's actually an amazing story that Josephus records. Right? This is Josephus from, from Masada? He records the history of Masada for us. Yes. So Josephus is a complicated guy. We don't know enough about him. He definitely was Jewish and he led a Jewish army, battalion in the army. They were stationed, it wasn't superior, but somewhere in the, in the Galilee somewhere. And um, this was during the, the, the early Roman invasions before Rome came and decided we're going to destroy the whole Jerusalem. They were first trying to just target outskirt cities of Israel. And Josephus was a general of the Jewish army, and he and he said we're going to fight till um, he had a whole tactic. I forgot. Oh, anyhow, it ends up that um, they they didn't do well in battle. There's only a few of them left, and they made a meeting. They went to hide in a cave, and they made a meeting. And the decision was they're all going to kill themselves and not and die by honor, than by the hands of the Romans being captured. And so it ended up that Josephus and another person, I think. They were in charge of slaughtering everyone else who remained, and then they were going to kill each other. That's the Masada story. It's a separate story. It's also, so it happened so twice with him. Well, neither happened with him. He didn't die at either. He was not. He was not at Masada. He just told us the story. Oh, okay. but he was here. Oh. And in the end, um, he did not die or kill himself or allow himself to be killed in the end. I don't recall if the other guy did die or not. I don't recall. He, he emerged from the cave. And he was captured by the Romans and then taken to Rome. Now, it's not clear what happened to him. Did he remain a Jew just captured by the Romans? Did he become disloyal and join the Romans? Uh, the Romans definitely respected his talents and his intelligence. And um, he had a high, he was, he was stationed in a high level position there where he was privy to a lot of information going on so that's how he records a lot of history because he heard a lot of things going on the only thing is that he's a lot of his history he wasn't actually there he's just reporting to us what he heard from reports coming back to rome he does at the same time fill in a lot of gaps where the gemara does not talk about the whole masada is not in the gemara why is the masada story not in the gemara 
either for one of two reasons, either because there's a lot of, there's a lot, oh, maybe no survivors, or a lot of stories on the Gemara. The Gemara's not a history book. Or the extreme answer, which might be very plausible, is that the sages were not very um, fond of what happened there. Even though today Masada has been turned into this uh, great side of Jewish heroism, which I guess it is to a certain degree, and it's, and it may, anyhow, it's controversial. It's complex, like everything is, right? When you, you know, nothing is simple. Nothing is simple. So that's the most important lesson to take away from everything that we learn about. Okay. So, where are we? Oh, he records a story that during the times of the Second Temple, this edict, this is already when Rome was pretty much governing a lot of Israel, this edict came out that. Um, the Jews have to place images of the Roman emperor in the temple. And similar to like uh, when the Hashemunai, when the Greeks came in and they were putting all kinds of idols on the temple, see the Romans made this edict. And the Jews, there's a whole delegation of Jews that went to Caesarea to protest this. And the army there met, the, the Roman army met the Jews there and surrounded them and threatened them, either you step away or we'll kill you. They expected the Jews to back off in fear, but instead the Jews just stayed there or advanced further, and then they pulled their swords, and they said, we're going to slice you all in half if you don't walk away, and the Jews apparently dug a ditch and, and put their bodies in the ditch and put their necks out, and they basically said, go ahead, go ahead, cut off our heads. So the Romans, this Josephus records the story, so the Romans were like, oh, whoa, we didn't expect this kind of response. These guys are serious. They're for real. They're not, they're not afraid of their lives. They're really protecting the honor of their temple. So they backed away. And they removed the edict. And to, you don't have to put your... Um, see what Mr. Nefesh can do. So this is all, all uh, the story of Caesarea. Now, later, by the destruction of a temple, so then Rome sets up its capital there. And... A lot of the a lot of gladiators happened over there, and a lot of Jewish martyrs were killed over there. The famous Rabbi Akiva, right? If you, if you ever stood by that um, horse, what is it? The, that's where I do the, Rabbi Akiva was killed. That's what they say. And I was there a few years ago with the family for the Rabbi Dumar Mitzvah. We stood there and we spoke about it, and we made a prayer. We spoke about Rabbi Akiva. He was killed there, and other martyrs were killed on that site in front of thousands of were, Romans. Were all ten more? No, no. no. That story. So that's Caesarea. So the Gemara has a very, a pretty negative view of Caesarea because it really represents the capital of the enemy. So the Gemara says, It was a spike stuck in the side of the Jewish people already in the days of the Greeks. It already became a, a problematic city for the Jews. However, when the Hashmanoim, this is early, before the Romans, um, conquered the Greeks, the Assyrian Greeks. Then they renamed it into the captured Tower of Shir. Okay. Let's continue. We're going to be talking about Caesarea. Rabbi Yossi says, What's the meaning of the verse in Zechariah that says, I will take away his blood out of his mouth. And the detestable things from between his teeth. And he shall remain as a remnant for our God. What is the meaning of Zechariah? And the pastor continues, he will be a aluf liyuhuda. He'll be a chief for Judah. And the ekron hayevusi, ekron, the you will see the Jebusite. We just said, remember, Ekron refers to Caesarea. So the Gemara says, When it says, I will remove the blood from his mouth. This refers to, it refers to their house of Mizbeach, some altars, their sacrifices. I'll remove the disgusting things from the teeth. This is their house of piles. Piles of? Um, remember, that one of the ways that they used to worship the gods is to throw stones at these images. There was all kinds of, right, food or stones. So they had these piles of stones. That's part of their avodah zarah. But it should remain as a remnant, a remnant for God. 
despite all of their sacrifices and offerings and control and idols, this refers to the synagogues and the study halls of Edom. In other words, nonetheless, there is redeeming parts of Edom, meaning Rome, Edom, meaning Roman territory. You know, when you... Um, Okay, let's continue. The verse ends. And it should be like the chief of Yehuda and Ekron, like the Yevus, Yevusi nation. This refers to their feeders and circuses of the Romans. And eventually, masters of Judah, in other words, Jewish leaders, will be teaching their Torah in public. So, they may belong to the enemies and all kinds of terrible things may have happened there. But one day, they'll be converted into places of Jewish worship and Torah study. So Aluf, Aluf Yehuda means the chief of Judah. Eventually, the Jews will have chiefs and rabbis and leaders there. But Aluf also comes from the word, Aramaic word, to learn, to study. Aluf means to study. And Torah study will happen there also. Well, you were teaching about it. And yeah, we sat there in those places, right? I remember many years ago we were on a Federation trip to Israel and we had a Jewish concert with the Fisher in the theater. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was in that theater there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could imagine packing thousands of Jews in these places. It's a Jewish, it's in our hands. It's all happening as we speak. Amazing acoustics there. That yeah, theater is it's pretty amazing, that concert. Huh? Yeah, that theater is unbelievable. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Zupamios. So the pasuk in in um, the pasuk in Yeshua says that the children of Dan went up and fought against Leshem. What's Leshem? Zupamios is the city of Pamias. Ekron Tioker. We said earlier that Ekron should be uprooted. Zuke sorry, Bas Edom. This is. Caesarea, as we of, of the Romans, share some metropolis and Shemalachim that used to be a metropolis, um, capital city for their kings, for their emperors. Ikadamri, to those that say, the Marbiba Malchi. What, what do you mean it's a metropolis of, of kings? Some say that kings were raised there. The Ikadamri, the Mukmimino Malchi, and some say the kings were appointed from there. That was the um, government where the Residents would vote and appoint the kings over there. So it's all the glory. Typically, Caesarea Ekron represents the glory for a large period of time of the enemies, of the Greeks, of the Romans, those who built structures and in, in uh, against the Jewish God and the Jewish people. Do you say it, it has history with the Greeks also? That's it. That's yeah, we said earlier yeah. that it was already already in the times of the Greeks. It became a thorn in the eyes of the Jews. And then the Hashemunayim recaptured it, but later the Romans took it over again. So now the Gemara says, and this is a very famous teaching, Caesarea of Yerushalayim, Caesarea versus Jerusalem, right? Now, you know, there's a famous book, Athens and Jerusalem. Athens and Jerusalem, well, Athens is more the Greek empire, but then there's Caesarea or Rome. Basically, we always are, these are big uh, superpower societies that made very great contributions to society, if you think about it, right? So Athens and the Greeks gave a lot of culture, philosophy, math, science, and the Romans as well, architecture and design and, 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 and many bathhouses and, and civil services. Definitely contributed a lot in terms of their innovation and technology. At the same time, their faith systems was very much unlike the Jewish faith system. In addition to the fact that how, how anti-Semitic and, and persecuted they were of the Jewish people. And then you have Jerusalem. So you have these two opposing forces in the world, certainly from a spiritual perspective. Right? So the Gemara says, if, if someone will tell you, both Caesarea is dead and Jerusalem is dead, we're not just talking about the cities, we're talking about what they represent. That the Jews and their faith and their practice and their God and their concept is dead, but also the others are dead as well. al tamin don't believe that person. Yosh Vushtein, if someone comes and tells you they're both alive and thriving and leading, al tamin can't believe the matter. Charva Kesari, 
Yashva Yerushalayim. If somebody says, Kesar, Kesari is dead, but Jerusalem is alive. Oh, Harva Yerushalayim, Yashva Kesari, Jerusalem is dead, and Kesari is alive. Tommy, believe them. It's always going to be one or the other have the upper hand. The world will always be led by this force or that force. And the only question is, which one? Are you talking about the force of the time? Do you think this is a metaphor for the future? As... Um, for all times, it's the force of their spiritual system, faith system, lifestyle, culture. Typically, Judaism will represent, obviously, a monotheistic concept, which leads to a much more uh, moral lifestyle and a value system versus a pagan lifestyle that often led to a more hedonistic and lifestyle, which was clearly the Greeks, and it's one or the other. But that that prophecy was already stated when Yaakov and Esau were in the womb. Whoa. One's going to be up and the other one's going to be down. Look what the Gemara says. First the Gemara says, Shinema, it says in Pasuk, Il imalea imala hacharava. I shall be filled with the waste. In other words, if one of them is full, the other one is empty. If the other is full, the other one is empty. And Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak teaches, we already learned it out from the Pasuk of the prophecy given to Rivka, that she has twins. And, the, and we were told, two nations shall be opposed to each other and will always be fighting against each other. One of them will always have the upper hand and one of them will be, will be their downfall. So, in that prophecy, where one is up, the other one's down, do the do the Muslims play a role in this? I was I was thinking about that when I was saying, is this the future? Is this always our enemy? So it's interesting because Islam time? comes around much later. Yeah. When does Islam become Islam? And, and the Prophet, uh, whatever his name is, seven hundred. Yeah, much yeah, later. Yeah, yeah but, so, but, but so, it's, it's so, and, and so, right. And in scripture, Sukim refer to Rome, Edom, mm -hmm. a lot. And the root is in Esau. But then you have, of course, many prophecies. We do have, we do have Ishmael. Very good. But Esau so, is Amalek, right? Um, not particularly. Esau is Rome. But, but, Rome can be much broader than just Rome. Rome refers, it could be Christianity. That's all Asaph. There's a very interesting, I believe it comes from the Zohar. It's known, not just the Zohar, but from Medrash and from the Talmud, from many places, and it's alluded to in scripture, that they're going to be four exiles to the Jewish people. Galos Mitzrayim, exile of Egypt, Galos Bavel, after the first temple, we exiled to Bavel. Galus, uh, ah. So, yes, Galus Edom, which is the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. That's where we are now, no? Yes. But it also says Galus Madai, Galus Paras, the, the, the Persian exile, which is the dream of the Purim story. Okay, so we've had that, that sort of followed on from the Babylonian exile. Okay, so we are in Galus Edom right now, which is the most harshest exile we've been in here for 2,000 years. Destroyed by the Romans and never been rebuilt. So we still have another exile goal. This is the last one. We've got to get over this one. Oh, we're going to do the third time. But I believe it comes from the Zohar that says, and this is not rooted in scripture, but that the last stage of Golos Edom will become Golos Ishmael. Hmm. The Arabs. Ishmael. That's the last part. Of this exile so which actually probably in front of our eyes we're seeing that because i would say we don't generally live in godless edom anymore edom if you want to call it the christians are not the persecutors of jews anymore mm -hmm. they were for most of them yeah but you know let's trace when was it the 50s the 60s when did the pope go to the to the cartel but, and put a note even, and, 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 and apologize was, as the official reversal yeah. position well hitler was great was, 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 was not edom yeah, he was. Well, I think it's considered to be. Yes. Okay. But at some point well, after that, there was the, the, I don't remember when the years were, there was the formal apology of the, yeah. of the church, a reversal of its positions that the Jews killed Jesus or whatever. So there's been a major reversal. I'm not saying all Christians are like that, but um, 
but the current, the current administration. <laughs> but um, you know, for the past few decades, it's the Arabs that have had the most. Uh, again, so Mike. So there's my question again. If one is up, one is down. Now you have this. Now we have. Entity. Now your small is up. Maybe. So, but the Amalek, what's happening in Israel? Who's, who's, attack, Amalek, who's attacking Jews every day in Israel now? But there's an Amalek of the time, right? Okay, so I'm talking about Amalek. Amalek was a grandson. He was a descendant of Ishmael. No, I saw. Esau. He was uh, okay, third so, generation from so the There was a person named Amalek who was a descendant of Esau. Grandson of the Esau. Amalek? That's not the one who fought um, Moshe? Not, not him for sure. It was not but a descendant of him. Yes. At that point in time in the Torah, Amalek is not a name of a person anymore. Now it's the name of a exactly. tribe. But I guess it's rooted many generations earlier in the person of Amalek. And then it's a tribe. And that tribe, the Torah says you have to destroy. Does do members of that tribe still exist nowadays? It's not clear. I mean, no, no there's no original members of any tribe now. Right? Except for hopefully the Jews. Hopefully we are true Jews still rooted in uh, our original but ancestors. Cohen's are really Cohen. We, we are. Right, you know Rabbi Manus, Manus Freeman? He, Rabbi Manus oh, Freeman, yeah. Rabbi Manus Freeman <laughs> says a story. <laughs> Rabbi Manus Freeman says a story that he was once brought out to speak, give a lecture in Rome, one of the maybe Chabad's or synagogues there. And then after lecture, he had to get into the cab to go to catch a plane flying out of there. And he gets to the cab, but it's taking forever to get to the airport because he didn't realize there's like a national holiday that day and every, one of those holidays everyone's on the streets and partying and going crazy and the car couldn't move so he made like a comment to the cab driver how did we get all these romans to to move so the cab driver left and the cab driver told him rabbi there are no romans left in rome nobody hears original romans the only people that live in rome today that are remnants of their original Ancestry is who? The Jews. No one else has an original Roman, but Jews are original Jews. But um, good answer by the cab driver. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. But Amalek was it wasn't Amman family from Amalek? Who? Amon? Oh, Haman. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. so then how do we how are you saying that all of them disappeared? They didn't kill them. Oh, I'm saying today. Oh, you don't know that. They've right? been they've been mixed. They've been mixed into societies, and I mean, they haven't been uh, they've been preserved as a tribe today. But so we know that Agag was a descendant of Amalek. Agag in the times of King Shaul, and Shaul killed everyone except for him, right? Which was the disaster. Which is why he was able to have a child, and and then Hamam was also, yeah, that is correct. Today, we don't know. We can't identify a particular person that's part of the original tribe of Amalek, but Amalek became more broadly known as uh, anyone who has the characteristics of Amalek. Yeah. Where are we? Second paragraph. Rabbi Yosef? Yeah, but I'm Rabbi Yitzchak. 225. Yeah? Okay. On the top. Bama Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak taught as follows. Maidir Siv Yuchan Rasha Balaman Sedek. What's the meaning of that which it says in Yeshayahu? Let favor be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. And the verse continues in the land of uprightness, he will deal wrongfully will not behold the majesty of the Lord. This is a general discussion about our approach to the wicked, especially the wicked who prosper. Right, famous question, why do the wicked prosper? Mm -hmm. Why do good guys come last and bad guys come first? Right? Story of life. So the Gemara explains, Rabbi Yitzchak explains, Amar Yitzchak Baruch Hu, that the original Yitzchak, father of Asaph, Turned to God and said, the Rebbeinu Shlela, Master of the Universe, Yuchan Esav. Please show favor to my son Esav. Remember, Yitzhak is a big fan of Esav, right? Mm -hmm. He wants to bless him. 
And God is telling Yitzchak, no, 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 Yisov is uh, not good. Well, Yitzchak pleads to Hashem, he's my son, show him favor. Amalei said, God responds, Rashahu, what do you mean? He's a wicked person. He can't. Amalei said, he responds back to God, Baalom HaTzedek, will he not learn righteousness? He can change. We don't give up on anybody. Why are you giving up on my son? So Amalei, God responds, Be'eretz Nechoiches Ye'avel. In the land of uprightness, he will deal wrongfully. He is going to end up destroying the Jews. But you don't get punished for something that you're going to do in the future. Uh, how do you know that? Where do we know it from? Maybe Ishmael. From Ishmael. What happened to Ishmael? So the, Gemara, the Torah says Ishmael was sent away with his mother Hagar from the house of Abraham, and they were thirsty and starving, and the child almost died. And then Hashem made a miracle, and they had a spring of water appeared. And the language of the Torah is, yeah, that Hagar, very good, turns to Hashem and says, look at my child, Ba'asher Hosham, he's lying there. Please have mercy on him. It's a strange expression, Ba'asher Hosham, he's lying there. So the Gemara comments, God responds, because when God was going to provide a miracle to, to the angels in heaven, came to God and said, why are you saving him? You know how much destruction Yishmael is going to bring in 2022. To the Jews in Israel. If you just would have killed him there, we'd be spared from the whole thing. Hello. <laughs> so God says, Ba'asher Husham, as he is lying over there. When I judge a person, I judge them the way they are now. What is he now? A little child, innocent child. Of course, I'm going to save him. You're going to tell me to judge him now based on what's going to be in the future? We don't do that. Which raises a lot of questions. Because if you recall, there's a very famous mitzvah in the Torah called Ben Sorer Umore. Yeah, we have this young child, 12 and a half year old, that's, you know, stealing some money from his parents and eating like a glutton. He's just being a teenager. And, and, the, and, 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 the, and the Torah says, you have to kill him. Why? Because we know this kind of child is going to turn up to be a murderer. That's not relevant. Now he's just an innocent teenager. Okay, he's acting a little wild. Give him a few pets and, and put him into place. But don't kill him. You can rehabilitate him. So the whole, that, that premise of Ben Sora is a complete conflict to um, the Ba'asher Hosham teaching about Yishma. That's true. So for those who remember when Rabbi Wolf came down for a Prabha Shabbos for a trial Shabbos before he was hired here in the portion of Lech Lechol Vayera, 11 and a half years ago, he gave a whole shir about it. Wow. Was that your first shir? Here. Yeah. It was in the social hall. I remember Thursday night. I think I remember what I said. 11 and a half years ago? I sure hope you remember what you said. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Anyhow, so... Here God saying that he's going to destroy the Jews, he's going to destroy Jerusalem. Right? So then Yitzhak says, in Cain, Baal Yire Geyozba. If that is so, then he shall not behold the majesty of the Lord. Then I agree. Um, you should not deal with him favorably. However, that doesn't preclude nonetheless that the wicked do prosper. The fact is, Rome was able to destroy Jerusalem. Bavel was able to destroy Jerusalem. The Greeks were able to cause, right? That's the fact. And today, Ishmael has a lot of power, unfortunately, mm -hmm. to kill Jews. How could God let it happen? It happens. So they get punished in this world, and they don't go to the world. Apparently. They don't get the things they're waiting for when they think they're going to the world to come. All those uh -huh. uh, virgins up there. <laughs> No, sir. I have a bitch to sell you. <laughs> We're waiting for sending men up there. <laughs> <laughs> a little more. Um, okay, we're going to start a bit of a lengthy discussion now, but we can start it because we have a couple more minutes. Yeah.
Well, maybe I'll just uh, conclude with a the Alter Rebbe in Tanya talks a lot about this concept om one is up, one is down in terms of Kesaria or Jerusalem or Yishmael and Yitzchak and he applies it in a spiritual way within ourselves between the Yitzhara and the Yitzhatov one is up and one is down all the time and the Tanya in the Tanya he makes a very I think it's a pretty revolutionary teaching and concept and that is as follows that there is no such thing or action or decision or moment in your life where you can be neutral you're either being holy for that moment or you're being unholy but you're not being neutral there's no such thing as neutrality it's either jerusalem or it's Caesarea. it's either yitzchak or it's asaph what about monday so you might, there's no such thing as monday you know, you may say, if I'm studying Torah, if I'm doing a mitzvah, if I'm Shabbos, I'm doing a mitzvah. If I'm lying, cheating, hating, saying Lashon Hara, that's a sin. What about if I'm just sitting, uh, sipping a cup of beer or tea and watching a movie? Bad. Is it? Depends on time. Exactly. What if I'm just spending time with your kids. playing chess with my child? So the Alter Rebbe says it's never neutral. It's either good or bad. And that, when it, when it, when it comes to that mundane area, that's the biggest test because there it's your choice. If you're doing a mitzvah, you're doing a holy act. God made it a holy act. If you're doing a sin, God made it a bad act, right? But it, when you're in the, when we're in the gray zone, in the neutral area, you will be deciding if it's holy or if it's, and if, and if it's not, then it's going to be unholy. That's so tough. So oh. you to move yeah. And most of our lives are lived in the gray area. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, is spending an hour with my child going to the movie theater good or bad? You will get to decide. You could do it in a, you could make it into a holy encounter based on how you behave in the moment and what's going to, what's going to lead to. Or you can do it in an unholy way based on how you conduct yourself in the moment and what it leads to in your life. That's your decision all the time. So if you're playing with your child, it's what it's going to be leading to, whether it makes that um, moment. Can, well, you can play two ways. You can play with, the, with your child and be aggressive with him and be, um, I don't know, uh, demanding of him, overly demanding and, and setting up. Distracted, him. not really with him, distracted on the no, phone and no, not paying attention. Or, or so so now you've turned this encounter into a very unholy encounter. But if it's quality time, it's good. Right? Yeah. So go and play in tennis. You decide. Because if you're doing it for exercise, it can be holy, right? You're improving your... If you play tennis because you need some outdoor sun and some respite and some exercise and some friendship with somebody else, and this is going to nurture a relationship, it's going to restore, reinvigorate your health, etc., etc. And why you got, why are you concerned about reinvigorating your health? So that you can... Go ahead and be more awake at the Gemara Shir tonight. Or be more alert with your family. Or whatever. Great. Holy, holy, holy. But if you already p- played four hours of tennis, you got all the sun you need. And now you're supposed to end the game and go to the Gemara Shir. <laughs> but instead you're like, let me skip the class. I can play another hour of tennis. Something tells me that hour is unholy. You didn't need it. Is it the uh, yes. You know, obviously things like exercise, spending time with your family are, you know, positive things. What about the not necessarily negative, but not also positive things? What if, you know, for instance, you're the type of person you need to watch 30 minutes of, you know, mindless television. It's not, you know, educational, it's not beneficial, but it's just, it's something that you feel that you need so that you can like you said, be alert and be a so that, so, Excellent question. It all comes down to motivation. What's the motivation behind it? There's either a redeeming motivation, which turns it into a holy act, or there's a motivation of, of laziness, yeah, selfishness. I'm feeling lazy right now. So yeah, this is because a, this you could a, argue that instead of doing those, I, I, trust me, I watch TV as much as the next guy, but, but you know, you could argue that instead of watching that TV, because I... 
I, you know, enjoy watching TV too. You could read a, a good book or something, which is probably better than watching but, NCIS. But, but sometimes, but sometimes that's, that's yeah. what you need. I mean, you are, let's say you do it because you need some downtime. You need some downtime. And you need stress and just forget about everything else that's going on. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm up for that. This <laughs> is the hardest thing in life. And this is actually the bulk of our lives. Yeah. It's basically how you're framing your life. Who else is here? <laughs> Anyhow, there's a lot to talk about this, but um, it's tough. It is. It is. Because, like you say, most most of the days, not the day, but a lot of stuff is great. Take for example. You, you hire an employee, yeah? You have to work for me nine to five. I expect you, I'll give you, let's say, a half hour, hour lunch break in the middle, but during work hours, I need you to be 100% focused on work. And what does that mean? Let's say somebody comes to the door and the employee gets up and has a conversation with that person. You're going to look at them. Why are you wasting time talking to them? Why aren't you working? Well, she or he may say, I am working. Part of my work is to greet people that come in. Maybe they'll be a potential customer. Like, how do you draw the line? When, what is work and what is not work, right? Now, of course, if I give you a task, you have to get it done. That's black and white. That, that. But there's, every moment there's decisions. Should I, I get a text message. Is this going to be a distraction to my work? Or maybe this is part of my work. Well, it depends. It depends what it's nurturing and what it's doing. What it's doing to me, what it's doing to a potential customer, what it's doing for the image of the company, for the reputation. Like, there's actually all kinds of gray areas and, and as an employer, I think it's important to to nurture or respect an employee in this way. To know, uh, we, we know that you know, you know if you you've got to trust, you got to create an environment where where there's you you, you trust them that the, the, their activities and their decisions are in the context of work. Now, you know, you may say at work we ban Facebook. Okay, you don't want to go online. Okay, that may be a, a good decision. Or maybe if they spend time on Facebook, that will help. Whatever. There's no black and white, and that's the hard thing about this. You say that Hashem is our employer? Yes, he is. And he Who's wants to know, he wants to know that the difference Sorry, is the difference is the difference is we don't work for him nine to five. <laughs> we have a twenty four seven job. <laughs> but that job means I want you to live like a Jew. Get sleep. Is sleeping uh, wasting your time? No. Actually, the Yetzirah says, get less sleep, stay up later to watch the movie or whatever. The Yetzirah says, go to sleep earlier and get more sleep. Yetzirah is saying that. Why? Because you're going to be a better person tomorrow if you get more sleep. The Yetzirah says, eat junk a whole day. The Yetzirah says, eat a good meal. Sit down. Eat it right. Don't be distracted. Drink. Now focus on the eating. It's probably it's very hard to focus, to spoke, focus 20 minutes on a good lunch or a good dinner, you especially mean I when I can't read the news while I'm eating my lunch. Okay. That's not holy. That's a great area. I need to figure that one out. And the rabbi used to very often tell the story about the, I'll conclude with this, about the Rajbar, the Shlomo Ben Anderet, who was one of the great Rishonim, writes a lot of commentary on Gemara. If you're in Yeshiva, you study his works a lot. And the Rebbe would describe, he was a very busy person. Because he was a Rosh Yeshiva, he ran a Yeshiva. And he was giving, I think, two shirim, two classes every single day, plus fielding questions and managing all the students. He was also a Rav and he had a community managing that. And he was also an author writing books. I mean, this is a guy that didn't have time to breathe. But he had the habit and he had the uh, uh, custom that every day, every afternoon, he would take, I think it was a 20-minute walk uninterrupted, undistracted. And during that walk, he would not think about the Torah and the classes he had to give. He had to be a, 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 a clear mind. And that was holy. Because those 20 minutes were recharging him. So I was once walking on the street. I was in Kolo in New York. And we, and we used to walk back and forth. And we called to the house. We'd like, uh, in those days, we had what? The... Um, yeah. iPods, what's it called? IPods, iPods and, and yeah. And I would listen to classes or whatever. There was no podcast in those days, but yeah, online classes. So once my the Rush Kudel met me on the street, I was walking, I was listening to something, and he asked me, uh, 
what's going on with this? I said, so I thought I'm answering a good answer. I said, uh, I'm listening to a class. I'm learning as I'm walking. So he responded to me. He said, you always do that when you walk? I said, yeah. So he said, is when trachstu? So when do you think? His message was, you have 10 minutes walking from home now? Use that time to think. But you, you would get other answers from other people too, or other ways of thinking that why waste a minute? Learn something also. What? It's it, whenever I'm in the car, it's always, they put on the radio, they put on a song, they put on a podcast, right? It's always something, but then sometimes it's like, how about putting on nothing? I can't be in the car. Yeah, but, really? <laughs> I can't. So when do you think? What do I think? When? When? Do you, I, I think. That's why people you, say you know, the shower. Shower. The shower. You yeah. know, unfortunately, when I think, when I'm back in my Ah, that's the biggest it's uh, are. I know. I, the, it's like, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, what do I have to do today? It's hard to focus on yesterday. Ciao. How do I know?